to them. I know you have developed your reasoning with having genocide as the kind of a foil to think about it. Uh, the, I am not in any way indicating an analogy there. Okay? So let me state this. But uh, Hannah Arendt has, in, I think in the introduction to Vita Activa, the human condition, made, she, couldn't, she, she could not possibly have known what would become possible with the modern technology. Still, having eugenic practices in mind, she indicated that we are on our way maybe to this new, um, to these new possibilities which will allow us to choose people with modern medicine. So, do you have any reflections on that? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> I, I think I have a second paper on that. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. It's a hard question. Um, my, okay, I have, I have two, two answers to it. The first um, has to do with Arendt's uh, anti-technological bias and her fear that the use of technology um, uh, could lead to um, artificial forms of life or artificial reproduction, as she put it. Um, I think that she um, was, um, was very much uh, uh, influenced by the Nazi uh, experiments in eugenics and that that led her to be very skeptical of um, technological interventions in reproductive life. Now, um, I think uh, that said, we have to make some distinctions uh, between um, uh, modes of technological intervention in reproductive life. Um, I was interested, for instance, in France when um, um, uh, um, access to reproductive technology was made available to married heterosexual couples and the technology was um, described as um, assistance, as assistance. So, you know, they're doing the natural thing but they needed a little help because uh, it wasn't quite working and a little, techno little technological intervention was fine. But if single women uh, wanted to use the same technology that was considered, um, at least in, in the words of Le, Le Monde, monstrous, right? And a practice of eugenics um, and against nature. And even when, um, when uh, 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 gay or lesbian couples sought to make use of technology, there were some philosophers who claimed um, that this was a, a return of fascism. Um, it's of course extremely interesting to me that in the state of Israel, the use of reproductive technology is encouraged in order to reproduce the population and lesbians get lots of access to reproductive technology, especially if they're going to reproduce Jewish children and help achieve demographic advantage. All of this says that I think we need to be very careful about asking which technology, for what purpose, um, and whether it is uh, explicitly involved in the reproduction of races <laughs> or whether it is explicitly involved in the, the, um, uh, uh, the reproduction of certain social forms of marriage or sexuality. And we, I think we would come out with very different kinds of answers depending on what the analysis is. So, um, so, so that's my, that, that, that's the response to that. I think that there is some fear that uh, I'm making a right to life argument. Um, uh, and um, but what I'm trying to do is take the concept of life back from the right wing um, and mobilize it in the service of articulating a notion of livable life. Um, because, of course, the, although uh, the argument against genocide does rely on a simple right 
to exist of those who already exist, right? It, that is the presumption. It's those who already exist have the right to exist. Um, it doesn't say who may come into being, right? It doesn't, doesn't look at that. But um, uh, it seems to me there's another part of my argument which is actually about the ethical obligation to produce institutions that um, produce sustainable or livable life. And I think it's, it's at that point that, we, um, that, that my position departs from the, um, the ethical right to life argument. I would need another paper to lay that out, but I assure you that the distinction's there. Hello. Um, I was wondering if our individuated existence is conditional uh, on precariousness or, or injurability or alternatively on a, on a democratic polity framework, um, isn't that still to a certain extent uh, um, an argument of an ethics out of self-preservation? That is, if... if uh, uh, the life, preserving the lives of the other is, is a, a precondition of the self, aren't we, uh, to a certain extent, still arguing out of the self? Um, it's a fine question. Um, if it's the case that I only am obligated to preserve the life of the other because I must preserve my own life, and if my own life is the final reason why I preserve the life of the other, then you're absolutely right. But if in preserving the life of the other, I am articulating my social and political existence in the relation to the other, then I have left an ego-logical framework for a relational one, and I have lost my bounded I, <laughs> um, or rather recast it as a certain kind of relational um, uh, re existence, even a relational practice. So um, I would be preserving my, I would be preserving my self, my new self, my recast self, um, uh, as a secondary effect <laughs> of preserving the life of the other, since it would turn out that I am bound but it wouldn't be for myself rather than the other or mm, on the basis of any other distinction between self and other that that act of preservation would occur. Any more questions? Um. My name is Stefan Helgeson, um, uh, and thank you so much for uh, a tremendously profound and substantial lecture. Uh, I would just like to put some pressure on uh, what you said about the, the here and the there of the unwilled ethical encounter. Because if we first consider the here, then it seems to me as though the frequency and intensity of the unwilled ethical encounters differs immensely between societies, and, and this is an obvious fact. It, it, it depends on, <clears throat> on the level of inequality in any given society. Um, when it comes to the there uh, of the unwilled ethical encounter, I, I detected in your argument almost a naturalization of um, of the media, of, of the, the, the media conditions uh, to which we are subjected. And um, there I'm just wondering if uh, you, you could say something more about uh, the, the limits of, of the, 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 the distant ethical solicitation. Uh, if I were to give a Concrete example here, uh, I experienced very strongly um, at the beginning of the uprising in Libya now, how I was, um, I was called upon ethically by these images of a country which I've never visited, a country where I have no uh, personal friends, and yet I, I found it unbearable 
to see these images of civilians being attacked. At the same time, uh, every single day, every single minute, there are millions of potential images that do not reach me. 